Welcome everybody to this uh, transformative salon um, or salon. I don't know how you pronounce it even. Uh, <laughs> salon is maybe more about shooting people. This is more about entertaining people. Uh, I'm really thrilled uh, to present to you uh, Helen Thompson, who has arrived this morning from Cambridge by night train, as I heard, traveling, given her topic, the way how she should be traveling, energy consciousness. Probably because she's dealing with energy, she knows, you know, how to, it's important to save energy. So let me tell a few words about our speaker today. Um, if that, yeah, it still works. So Helen Thompson is a professor of political economy at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge. And her, uh, her topics is international political economy. She mostly deals with issues of energy, finance, and geopolitics. And she has written a number of books, among them Oil and the Western Economic Crisis, from which came out in 2018, uh, China and the Mor and Mortgaging of Europe, which came out in 2010. And actually, I have a copy, just a moment. Her most recent book, also the reason for this invitation, is basically uh, Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century. And for everyone who hasn't uh, read that book, I highly recommend it because it's really a tour de force and an eye opener on many, many levels. So she deals in that book with the geopolitics of energy, with the financial international financial monetary system and with domestic politics and democracy. So no small topics and somehow they are all related. In any way, um, so the talk today I think is building exactly on this book. I should also say it, it came out basically almost the day, maybe a month after, right? Exactly. The day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So, and given that the book has a chapter that finishes on Ukraine, uh, I, I think one of the uh, issues we will hear is, you know, how has your thinking evolved since, uh, since the war started the way it started? And, but uh, the book gives you a lead of what, or some of the elements of what has led to the war. So um, I'm very much looking forward to listening to you, Helen, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Doro. I hope that I can be heard at the back. Is this, is this mic? Yeah, good. It's an absolute um, pleasure to be in um, Vienna. Vienna is a city I like very much. Last time I was here was the summer before the pandemic, which now seems quite a long time uh, ago. Uh, so I was delighted to be able the chance to, um, to come back. And I think it's as as good a place in as any in in Europe to think about the kind of questions that I've been interested in for the last few years, and that, as Doris says, the war have kind of shaken really sharpened, I should say, uh, pretty um, acutely. What I want to do uh, today or this evening is to try and give like a long historical perspective as to to where we are in Europe and to what I call Europe's energy reckoning. And just to give you some sense of, of where we're going and where I'm going, because I'm going to dwell in the past for a while, is going to want to end up with really the two energy, in a way I would say crises that Europe as a whole face. The first about fossil fuel energy and gas in particular in relation to the war and the second about the uh, energy transition and I want to situate that both in the long history of Europe's disorders in the 20th century but also tie them to the way in which energy in my view has been central to the project of European unity um, since the beginning at least in its 20th century forms um, anyway. And in order, I think, to, to understand this, we need to start with two fossil fuel energies and to see something that's very different about them. The first is about coal, and the second is about oil. Now, what was true about coal was, as we know, it led my country uh, into the industrial revolution before any other uh, country. And it's really impossible, I think, to understand British imperial power in the middle of the 19th century 
without understanding the centrality of coal and Britain's geographical fortune around coal to Britain's early um, industrialization. I also think it's pretty difficult to understand Germany's economic rise when Germany was unified in 1870, separate from the issue of Germany's geographical fortune where coal was concerned. But that isn't all that there is to be said about coal in European countries, because some European countries, I would say most consequentially France, were not so geographically um, fortunate. And it was also the case for Germany that it didn't have the same, quite the same advantage that Britain had, because when it's, it didn't have coal and iron deposits basically right next to the coal. And what, I mean, this is slightly schematized, but I hope it will be clear from my, the, why I'm doing this, is one way of thinking about this is to see Alsace Lorraine uh, as a place that had to be fought over from Germany's point of view because of iron deposits. And the other side of the Rhine had to be fought over from the French point of view because of coal. So if we, if we think about the coal story in Europe, it's a story that incites, if you like, intra European conflict, central to conflicts between France and Germany, whether that's the Franco-Prussian War, the First World War, the Ruhr Crisis, the Second World War. Oil is a very different story because when the age of oil begins, really I'd suggest in the latter part of the 19th um, century, but really accelerates at the beginning of the 20th century as it becomes clear that oil will replace coal in naval ships. Uh, no European country, if we exclude Russia as being a European country, except actually Austria has, well, Austria and Romania, I should, I should put the Romanians in, has oil. And the two big oil producers are the United States and Russia. And I don't think it's a coincidence at all that those two countries, albeit in the form of the Soviet Union in Russia's case, go on to dominate geopolitically the 20th um, century. But from the point of view of European countries, including obviously Britain, the most powerful state in the world at the beginning of the, the 20th century, the age of oil looks like it's going to be a disaster. And the the British and the Germans, right from the start, I'd say from the 1890s, understand that they need empire now to secure oil. Or they need, if not direct empire, then they need spheres of influence where there is oil. And one way of thinking about this, again, I'm going to make things a bit more simple than they are at times to make the point, is the British concentrate on Persia quite successfully in a way. Oils discovered in Persia, present day Iran in 1908. Germany concentrates uh, on the Ottoman Empire, particularly Mesopotamia. The Kaisers, Wilhelm's very keen on cultivating the relationship um, with the Ottomans for that reason. Um, the French at that point don't actually get themselves really into the Middle East, but they do have French money go to Russia. And at that point, the center of the Russian oil industry is in Baku, in, in present day um, Azerbaijan. Um, so what we see during at the beginning of the, of, of the First World War is growing geopolitical competition between Britain and Germany to control oil resources in the Middle East. All the European countries being dependent upon importing oil either from Russia or from the Western Hemisphere, which means the United States principally, but also um, Mexico um, and um, Venezuela. What we see in the First World War then is, is that those crucial sites of oil in Eurasia, meaning in the Middle East and in Baku, are fought over. In some sense, you might say they're the geopolitical prizes of the First World War. And the outcome of that is that 
Britain and France get their position in the Middle East. Most benefits uh, Britain, but France is also a winner and indeed gets handed um, the Deutsche Bank's share in the Turkish Petroleum Company, um, which have the rights to explore for oil in Mesopotamia. And then there's a, there's a huge fight goes on in the latter part of the First World War about the Baku oil fields. And at different times, the British, the Germans, the Ottomans try to get them. And they end up back with the Soviets. And again, in the same way in which Germany loses in the Middle East in the First World War, it loses that fight in Baku over um, Baku. And as I say, it has, Deutsche Bank has to hand over its share in the Turkish Petroleum um, Company. So one way then to, to, to understand the catastrophes that are going to come in the interwar years and through the Second World War is to see what a problem Germany has uh, at the, 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 the peace uh, of 19, well, let's just say that the, the, the final conflict, say by the time that present day Turkey um, is um, established. And what you see in the Weimar period is an attempt to find a technological solution to that problem, which is to use the resource that Germany does have, coal, and turn it via technology into oil, so synthetic oil. The Germans actually do that remarkably successfully, and that begins in the Weimar period. But obviously, where the Nazis are concerned, that is not deemed sufficient, and Hitler embarks upon the conquest of, I mean, I, I know the conquest of Eastern Europe and Southern Russia isn't just about Baku, it's about Ukraine and the agricultural land there too, but part of it is an obsession with um, Baku, and then that means the annihilation of the populations um, living there. So there isn't, I think, any way really of escaping how the dark part of the 20th century in Europe is bound up with the question uh, about um, oil. Um, what then we might understand the post-war period um, as is a way in which Western Europe in general and West Germany in particular try to grapple with the problem in which conquest and empire are no longer any part of the solution, can no longer be any part of the um, solution. In the British case, the British can obviously stay in the Middle East after the Second World War initially. And not only can they stay there, but actually the Americans are actually now quite keen for the British to stay as the imperial power in the Middle East because they don't want West European countries either importing oil from the United States or indeed anywhere else in the Western Hemisphere because the Americans are sufficiently worried about their long-term supply and they want it for themselves essentially. Neither from at least 1948-49 do they want West European countries importing oil from the Soviets or but, albeit it should be said at that point, the Soviet oil industry is in quite a dilapidated state um, after the Second World War. So the Americans are saying to West European countries, you need to import oil from the Middle East. We are relying on the British to be the guarantor of your energy security um, in the Middle East because we don't want to play that role um, for um, ourselves. In West Germany's case, on the coal side, initially, there is also the problem that actually there's lots of restrictions that are put on Germany's coal production in the Ruhr as a terms uh, of the um, peace. So Germany kind of, West Germany, I should say, begins the second, the post-World War, Second World War period with no energy sovereignty, I would suggest, and that a story of Germany's history through the rest of the 20th century 
has been about trying to claw that sovereignty back again. I would suggest to the point that now some of it has been lost for reasons I'll come obviously um, come um, back to. But I think what's important to see then is what a turning point the Suez crisis of 1956 is. Now, now I'm British. I grew up being told endlessly in my, I don't think we were taught about it at school, to be honest, but in my university education in British politics, they would tell us that the Suez crisis was all about British hubris, the British empire, finally, but people are ruling the British empire, finally realizing that time was up um, and they were taught the lesson about the realities of the post um, imperial um, world. And I came during the course of writing disorder to realize that this was a, it's not untrue narrative, but there's much, much more to be said about the Suez crisis than that. And it's a real turning point, I would say, in Western Europe's whole 20th century uh, history. Because basically what it says, what it said was, what happened there was when the British and the French tried to look after British and French and West German and Italian and the small West European countries too, energy security in the Middle East, in the way in which the British had been told they were supposed to, the Americans said, no, no, we didn't really want you to do that because we don't want you to do something that looks like your anti-Arab nationalism. But it's a turning point because the reaction, not just in Britain and France, but in West Germany in particular, is one of absolute fury. Adenauer thought it was a complete, Conrad Adenauer, the West German chancellor, thought it was a complete betrayal of German, sorry, European reason of state, what happened over Suez. He went to Paris during the crisis. He was, seems to have been there when Anthony Eden, the British prime minister, called Guy Mollet, the French prime minister, and said, we're having to stop. And he turned to Mollet and he said, Europe will be your revenge. And you can't really, I think, understand the beginnings of the 20th century Europe, sorry, the post-1945 European integration project outside the context of the, the Suez crisis and these energy questions. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but I just want to do one detour back into coal before we get on to the aftermath of Suez. Because if we think of the first three bits of successful European integration, European coal and steel community, European atomic energy community, European economic community. I think they've all got something to do with energy. The first two, obviously, but I, I want to suggest that the European economic community does um, as um, that does as well. So if we go back to the Franco-German issue about coal, and particularly France's side of the problem, we can see, I think, that actually having a solution to the coal problem of France's ability to import coal reliably, reasonably cheaply from Germany was actually a necessary condition of bringing Franco-German conflict to an end. And that is, I would suggest, what the fundamental purpose of the European coal um, and steel um, community um, was. Unless the coal problem was solved, particularly for France, there was not going to be peace between France uh, and um, Germany. Let's move then on to um, the Suez crisis, the aftermath of the, the, the Suez um, crisis. And we'll start with the nuclear power side of it and then move to the European Economic Community and oil um, side um, of it. Now, it's certainly the case that a number of European countries were attracted to the idea of atomic energy before the Suez crisis. It was really President Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace speech that really um, convinced pretty much all the West European governments, I, I would suggest initially, um, that there was an alternative energy future that would completely, as they saw it then, free them from this foreign energy dependency problem. Because they very much had internalized this idea that Europe's weakness came from its energy weakness. So if you had a, a form of energy that wasn't 
fossil fuel energy and which Europe wasn't at a disadvantage and could build its own nuclear um, reactors. Then there was the idea that Europe would get its energy autonomy or even sovereignty um, back again. And at this point, I know this is not the way that it turned out, but at this point in the middle of the 1950s, the hope was not just that nuclear power could generate all the electricity that any of us might want to use, but that it would be possible to replace oil in transportation with nuclear energy too. So if you listen, to, if you go back and read the speeches that are made, including the early speeches from officials within the European Atomic Energy Community once it was created, it's, it's full of this language of basically Europe getting its freedom by nuclear power and also by doing it supranationally and not just um, on a, um, an, um, a national um, basis. The problem, well, there was a number of problems, obviously nuclear power turned out to involve safety questions and probably even more importantly in practice, cost questions that proved extremely difficult um, to manage. But it's also the case that it didn't solve the resource, foreign resource dependency problem because uranium. So European countries didn't have uranium. The only one in initially that had uranium in one of its colonies was Belgium in the Congo. And the wartime Belgian government signed that over to the Americans during the course of the, of the war. Uh, so the idea that Eurotam could be, the European Atomic Energy Community could be a vehicle of European freedom from foreign resource dependency really fell down at the start on that um, problem. Uh, and in the end, by the 1970s, the, uh, the Americans who were selling considerable amount of the uranium, the rich uranium that was coming to West European countries for nuclear power under Carter, they embargoed the sale um, of it. So actually, well, there is, an, there is another incident, which we maybe talk, can maybe talk about later, of the Americans basically trying to restrict European energy policy. The uranium enrichment ban in the 70s is actually is actually the second um, of them. Just as a note, because it's got a parallel story in the moment, is, is that the place where France and West Germany turned after that was the Soviet Union. And it's quite significant that during the course of the war, um, the one energy source that hasn't in any way been subject to sanctions or indeed subject to embargo on the Russia side is on nuclear is on nuclear power. What then about the oil question and um, Suez? Now, one of the responses on the oil side was to push ahead with something that the Italians have been pushing since before the Suez crisis, which was the turn to Soviet oil. So Khrushchev at that time was interested in reconstructing the Soviet oil industry for export again. The Soviets had exported oil from the late 20s through to the mid 1930s. In fact, for Germany, it was a bit longer um, than um, that. So it's not that the Soviet oil trade begins only after the Suez crisis. It's more a resumption than a um, beginning. But that is the basis uh, that turn um, is the basis of the present tense European-Russian energy relationship that met its denouement last year um, with the, um, the beginning um, of the war. So there's a line that runs from like Suez, I would suggest, to the Ukraine um, crisis. But the other thing, or well, the thing that I particularly want to bring out about oil here is actually in relation to the creation of the European Economic Community. So at that point in 1956, in the autumn of 1956, the negotiations for what would become the Treaty of Rome were well underway, but they were kind of stalled and they were largely stalled, I would suggest like on the French side, there was considerable uncertainty in 
the French government, not necessarily amongst French officials, but amongst French politicians about whether they really wanted to go down this road. And he, indeed, at, at one point, sort of during the Suez crisis, Mollet had kind of like asked if it wouldn't be possible to have a union with Britain. Uh, it was, it, things were that sort of uncertain in what was going on um, in um, Paris. But the French were, in one sense, I would suggest, felt even more betrayed by what had happened at Suez than the British um, did. Not least, I would suggest, because they were probably betrayed by the British and the Americans, not just by the um, Americans. And they knew full well that there was a country where oil had been discovered that very year, 1956, and that was Algeria. And obviously at that point, Algeria was still a French colony. So from the French point of view, post Suez, in the immediate aftermath of Suez, the idea of having a large unified West European market in which Franco-Algerian oil could be sold into was extremely attractive idea. It's quite notable that while the French did not push to have Algeria as part of France included in, in the European coal and steel community, it was included under the Treaty of Rome until um, Algeria's um, independence. Um, and I think you can see, if you look at some of the, the rhetoric in France around this, and indeed the way that various African countries reacted to the Treaty of Rome, it was very much to see it as this was the moment in which Europe, Western Europe, was securing its resource base for the future. And that meant a resource base in Africa for a richer European um, market. Indeed, Molle, when he was in the United States, um, in um, 1957, on the completion of the European Economic Community Talks, told the US Senate, I'm firmly convinced that Eurafrica, meaning the union of Europe and Africa, with Africa providing the resource and the energy resource base, will be the reality um, of tomorrow. Now, this one obviously also fell down too, because the Algerians fought for their independence and they had it in 19. 62, and although as part of that, de Gaulle, the French president, Charles de Gaulle, negotiated a, uh, a very good deal for the French energy companies in Algeria, by the 19, early 1970s, energy nationalism was rife across the Middle East and across North Africa, um, and those French energy companies were nationalized. And so Algerian oil turned out not to be the answer either to um, Europe's foreign oil dependency um, problem. I want to turn now to, to gas, and this is going to get us to where we are in the, in, the, in the present, because gas is a different story in this, or in, in, in a number of respects. And I think that this is what I've kind of seen more clearly over the course of the last year since I finished, sort of since the book, I finished the book actually some time before, given how long academic trade publishers take to publish. Um, I see more clearly this gas story, I think, than before the war. So if you look at gas as an energy source, Europe's about four decades late to the show compared to the Americans. Americans start using gas in significant quantities in the 1920s. Europeans don't start using gas in significant quantities to the 1960s. It is a bit being used in industry, but at such low scale that even a country like Germany, which is, as we know, not well endowed with hydrocarbons at all beyond coal, could make do on domestic supply um, of um, gas. But there are three things that really, I think, change that position in the 1960s and the choices European countries make about gas. The first, again, is Algeria, that it wasn't just oil that was found in Algeria, but gas too. So that becomes an option and one the French are particularly keen on. The Dutch find the Groningen field, 
in the late 1950s, and it's clear that that is going to have its has a significant amount of of um, gas in it. Later, there's North Sea, but for Norway and Britain, but things had already moved by the point the North Sea really comes into um, play. And then there's Soviet gas, and in the same way in which Khrushchev was interested in well, in this case, Khrushchev and then Brezhnev, were interested in pushing um, Soviet oil into Western Europe because the Soviets wanted export earning, higher export earnings, and they were interested in gas too. And in the late 60s, the discoveries in West Siberia made it clear that there was enormous amounts of gas in, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, well, well beyond what had um, previously um, been um, the case. So really, the West European countries get to choose really what to do about this, the options. And the one, as we know, that really becomes the most significant really is the Soviet one. Now, interestingly, it's actually Austria that, with Italy, pushes hardest on this first. The, the, the West Germans are are late to the game, actually. And so although it is true that Brandt, Willy Brandt, after he becomes chancellor, sees that there's a way of tying energy trade with the Soviet Union to Ostpolitik, but he's also only actually following what the Austrian, and the Austrian government and the Italians have um, already um, done. And what you can see then through the 70s is that that gas trade with the, the Soviet Union becomes ever more important. And eventually new pipelines are built that connect Western Europe to that gas that's from coming from Western Siberia. Uh, and as we know, those pipelines still end up running through um, Ukraine. Now, what I just want to stress here is, and, and this is where the, the, the first incident, the first incident, well, I suppose you could say that Suez is the first case of, of Americans saying no to what Europeans want to do with energy in the post-war world, the first big no. The second big no is in the early 60s, when uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and immediately after it, the Kennedy administration basically wants European countries to stop selling pipe, steel pipes to the Soviet Union in building the oil pipeline that's going to bring oil from um, the Soviet Union to Western Europe, what, what becomes the Drusba pipeline. And what's interesting here is, is that actually the Italians kind of ignore the Americans, but the West Germans don't. They really don't. They, have, they, 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 buckle, they buckle under oil. I don't know, at least buckles under. What's interesting about the story in the then gas when we're moving on to, so it's 1969 when the first gas agreement, the West German, well, Soviet first gas agreement. There is no real American pressure at that point. Indeed, Lyndon Johnson, who's American president, pretty much holds his hands up and sort of basically says, you can do what you like. I mean, partly because he's preoccupied, uh, actually, so it's first Nick's Johnson and then Nixon because they're preoccupied with um, Vietnam. But it's also because at this point, the Americans have got ideas themselves that they might need Soviet oil and gas. And indeed, late Nixon is even talking about fusion projects with the, with the, with the Soviet um, Union. So European countries get into the age, let's call it, of the Soviet gas trade without this American problem really hanging over them even though the agreement that the, the, the first, I think, sorry, that the negotiations that, that Brandt pursues in March 1969 or in early 1969 is coming in the aftermath of the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. It's hardly a, a non-conflictual time in the Cold War in, in Europe when this is beginning. What changes though in the 80s, in the early 80s, is that the next of these Soviet Eastern rule, Eastern Europe crises, the one in Poland, where obviously the tanks don't come in from Moscow, but martial law 
uh, is declared in Poland. This time, the Reagan administration says that pipeline that you're building with the Soviets from Western Siberia, the Trans-Siberian pipeline is a problem and you need to stop it. And what's interesting is, is that the Europeans win that confrontation, is they make a few token gestures to the Americans, but essentially Reagan administration has to back down. And the British, Mrs. Thatcher, is actually very adamantly on the French and the German side about um, this and stands up to Reagan, even though the British are not going to benefit from the, from the, from the, um, the pipeline. Um, because she's quite willing to see the issue as one really of European energy sovereignty and that the Americans don't get to dictate how Europe deals with its energy dependency um, problems. I would suggest then if we think about the present that the first Nord Stream pipeline, so the one that was agreed by Schroeder in 2005 and that was completed and began operation in 2011, that still fits into that story. Even though it's becoming significantly harder to maintain European unity because by 2005, European Union, as we know, has Eastern European members, not least Poland, and Poland was from the beginning extraordinarily unhappy about the Nord Stream pipeline. The then Polish foreign minister compared it to the Nazi Soviet pact in 2005. But there wasn't much American pressure on that. It's becoming, at that point, it's an internally divisive European issue, but it's not really pushing West Germany into a loss of sovereignty over gas. What changes, as we know, is the second Nord Stream pipeline, agreed 2015 by Merkel, coming in the aftermath of Russia's annexation of Crimea. And then Schultz had to say it wasn't going ahead, even before the invasion came. So two days, I think it's either two days or three days before the invasion, he says, we're going to have a security assessment of this, which means it's not going to, which, which means it's not, it's not going to go ahead. And part of the reason for that is, is because he'd been to Washington and he quite humiliatingly had to stand next to Biden. And Biden said, if there's a war, we will find a way to bring Nord Stream to um, an end. And given that Germany then entered the, the war period, as we know, with no liquid natural gas ports at all, no long-term contracts because they didn't have any means of, of importing directly um, gas, then that was a humiliating end for, 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 um, for Germany. So I think that there's a really clear story to tell, which I kind of see a bit better now than I did perhaps, about West Germany in this, which is the way in which it clawed back its energy sovereignty through the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century and then it's been on um it, it started really I, I would suggest have a problem from the annexation of crimea and that now it's now it's in a it's in a very um difficult position well then about net net zero um, because this is obviously the hope that the energy transition, or as I prefer to call it, the energy revolution, um, is going to change all this. Um, that we as Europeans are going to be free, finally, from this problem that has in some sense haunted us since the beginning of the 20th um, century. And I think that there's something to this, in a way. In this, and I, I don't think if the energy revolution is successful, it will be quite as difficult as all this has been. That if you are using the sun and the wind and you're using electricity for many more purposes than we do now, particularly using it in relation to transportation, certain things that have been problems um, do go away um, because the sun and the wind don't belong arbitrarily um, to different places on Earth. I mean, obviously, you know, I come from a, an island where the sun doesn't shine that much. So 
Britain's solar prospects are not great, but Britain's wind prospects, on the other hand, are are pretty good. I live on, you know, I live on a soggy, windy, wet, windy um, island, and I think most parts of Europe have at least got one of them that go in there that that go in their um, favour. I think the difficulty, though, is as I'm sure some of you have already thought about, is this question about metals. Because here, Europe is not particularly well endowed with metals. It's, we still are geographically unfortunate in this respect. Now, I don't actually think, from, as far as I understand these issues, and I'm not, not at all a geologist, that the metals that are necessary for the energy transition are not quite as arbitrarily distributed under the Earth's surface as oil and gas um, are, or indeed coal for that um, matter. But there are asymmetries and they don't benefit Europe. And I think just as importantly, though, we have a, a politics in all pretty much most European countries that is really probably more sensitive to environmental questions, I would suggest, than perhaps anywhere else in the world, including North America. And so, so far as there are metals that are necessary for the energy transition in Europe, I fear that most Europeans, I don't necessarily, I'm not trying to get on a high horse, but I'm excluding myself, um, we're not that keen on the idea of the, of mining metals and the environmental damage that that brings with it and we're a bit keener on the idea that it happens in other parts of the world out of sight uh, and then we import them back and I think that that's going to be pretty difficult because I think that um, this really reignites in the countries that will be subject to our demand for these metals the history of Western European imperialism in other parts of the world. And these are countries that themselves not only want to do the energy revolution, but they also want much higher energy consumption than they presently have. And uh, what we in Europe are kind of telling them is that we want you to do the energy transition. We want you to help us do the energy, our energy um, transition by selling us um, metals and allowing our companies to invest in your countries. And by the way, we're holding on to our fossil fuel energy for as long as necessary to get through the energy transition, whilst we'll be telling you that you shouldn't be building new coal, coal powered fire, coal powered electric power stations, fire power stations. And I think that one of the unfortunate consequences of the war has been that we in Europe showed, and I'm very much including the United Kingdom in this, that in the emergency, that we went back to coal. I'm not saying anything about Austria because I don't know, but in Britain, there were three um, coal-fired power stations that were due to close and are now being kept open. In fact, in the early part of the war, um, they were also burning Russian coal, or at least one of them um, was burning Russian coal um, to, um, to do that. So our ability in Europe to do climate change diplomacy when we showed in the emergency that we will, in some sense, treat coal as the energy source of last resort, uh, I think uh, is, um, is um, pretty um, difficult. Um, I think that this is a few final um, thoughts. I think one of the problems that we face in Europe is, is that our expectations of energy consumption were formed in a geopolitical era that no longer exists. In fact, it hasn't really existed for some um, time. And I think that we have seen through the course of the war the way in which we have in significant part dealt with the absence of pipelined Russian gas by depriving poorer Asian countries, particularly Pakistan, of gas that they actually had on long-term um, contract. And it was worth it for the companies, whether they're Qatari or American companies, 
um, to break those contracts and pay the penalties and sell that gas more profitably on um, in European to European countries in um, spot markets. I think it also means that we have both common interests with China and also a rivalry with China is, is that our problems look more like China's because of our ongoing foreign fuel, sorry, foreign fossil fuel energy dependency. Uh, but we also will be competing with China for some of that supply, particularly gas. One of the things that probably made it easier for us to get through last winter was because China had as many economic problems as it did during the course of 2022. So its gas demand was significantly lower in 22 than it was in um, 20, um, 21. Um, if I wanted to finish on a kind of like optimistic note, I would say that though that Europe is a place where actually politicians and in a way citizens though in a complicated manner have been dealing with really difficult energy questions for a very, very, very long time. And I think although we live with inflated expectations of energy consumption, we've actually got in a way uh, a political classes that are quite hardened to the problems of energy. Now that might produce some unpalatable outcomes, like basically what happened with Pakistan during the course of um, last um, year. But I think there is a certain energy realism in, in, in Europe. And actually, although her policy on Russia gas came to a humiliating end, I think that Merkel did actually understand these questions really quite well. And I think if you look at what she said in her speech at Davos in uh, January 2020, so just before the pandemic was starting, she was gave a really realistic, honest assessment of where the energy transition had got to in Germany in particular. Um, and she wasn't being unduly pessimistic or fatalistic, but she was being very honest about it. And she said, you know, we're at a point where we need to basically think how we live our lives and that we may be turning our backs on the way in which we have lived our lives for a long time. And I think the fact that a European politician can talk in that kind of language does actually give me some kind of hope through this story. Thank you very much indeed for this, taking us really back to the last before last century and going all the way to our current predicaments. Now, if Merkel is the sign of hope, I have serious doubts. <laughs> And at least I wish she would have told this when she came to power, yeah. not after she left power, yeah. because I think there is, of course, something. Yeah. But anyway, thank you very much. Um, I guess we all need a little bit of digestion. Uh, so I open the floor for questions. If you need more time, I am happy to chip in, but I see already a raised hand. Mm. So please. Um, Bela Grashkovic, uh, Professor of Political Economy at the Central European University here in Vienna. And I spent many years of my youth actually in an economic research institute in Hungary where our main task was to figure out how to trick the Soviets with economic policy solutions to give more hard goods oil for low quality soft Hungarian manufacturing exports. And we felt patriotic when we found a solution. Now, <laughs> your lecture actually confronts me with the literature which I teach now uh, to my students, which is the literature about resource curves. So it's precisely a literature about countries which need to solve the problems of having oil. Your lecture is about countries that try to solve their problems uh, of not having oil. And then the resource curse literature basically tells the developing countries, okay, 
if you happen to have oil, the best solution is not to exploit it, but save it for the future. But if you exploit, uh, trust foreign multinational corporations, not your state-owned firms, mm. because they do it better. If you manage and you get revenues, don't spend it to your population, but rather save it for the future when the oil market is in bust. Now your countries or your historical uh, overview basically tells that countries that don't have uh, resources or oil either can solve the problem through coercion, right? Uh, and political influence or trade, mm. unequal trade or something in between. So here is my question. How do you relate these two contradicting literatures? Do these situations have anything to do together simply with each other? Mm. Speak to each other. I'm not an energy specialist, right? Thanks. That's a really good question. Um, I think it's, well, here we go. Several things come to mind. First of all, I think that there's something odd in the way in which their resource curse literature is so much bigger than any engagement with the resource dependency um, literature. There isn't a lot. Um, and well, you know, well, there is, but it come. It's really written. It's really written by historians without much conceptual framework to it. In the sense that they wouldn't use the language of res of resource dependency, but they, they, you know, there are obviously historians who would tell the history of significant parts of the twentieth century through the oil lens. I'm thinking of, for instance, like Peter Frankopan's book uh, on the Silk um, Road, where oil is very much to the fore in his 20th century um, account. But I don't think there's much engagement from political science or indeed within political economy about the resource dependency um, problem. I mean, I think that's, to be honest, in part because, or in good part, because so much political economy, I don't know what you think about this, Dora, is it, it just, it's never really, at least in the Anglophone world, it's never really got to grips with geopolitics. And so if you don't get to grips with geopolitics, I don't think you're gonna to get to grips with the kind of resource, foreign resource dependency that, that I'm um, talking um, about. I think it's also partly because it involves some really hard questions to think about as Europeans that, I think a lot of the time we'd rather just like not think too hard about. Um, and that's both in relation to empire and its relation to Germany's fate through the first half of the, the, the 20th um, century. And yeah, I, I, that's worth putting this. You need a certain kind of like, I realize at a certain point, you need a kind of certain kind of strength of mind to think about some of these questions. It's easier not to think about them. I think the really interesting question though, in a way about this is, is like the United States, because it's never really put into the, it's never really put into the category of the resource curse um, politics. It's seen as an example, well, it's either ignored or it's basically seen as an example where oil doesn't have to be a curse. But what I came to the conclusion was in writing the democracy part of my book. And I was, in the end, I could spend less time on this than I originally, I, I sort of had thousands of words that just, there wasn't space for and got scrapped, uh, is how much US politics, domestic politics in the 20th century is shaped by oil. And so the interesting thing there is, is like, why is that not in sharper focus in a lot of the literature? But also then what do you do when you get to the 70s and then instead of having a resource curse problem, so to speak, the US has a resource dependency problem, you know, that over a very short period of time, it moves from being largely domestically self-sufficient where energy is concerned to being the largest oil importer in the world. And 
what is then the destabilizing effect of that on American politics? And I tried to engage that a bit with what I wrote about America in the book, but as I say, it, it, it became a bit too difficult to hold the whole narrative together and spending too much time um, on that. But I think that in terms of political economy, that political economy both has to get to has to get to grips better with both of the both of the problems and not think that the resource um, curse, if we're going to use that language, is just something that happens to developing countries. I don't think that that's right, and I particularly don't think it's right in relation to the United States. Thank you. Are there any other? Yes, the mic must be somewhere there. Okay. Um, okay, can you? Um, I'm Christos. I'm heading the Office of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung here in Vienna, dealing with peace and uh, cooperation. So I, I have one question because on Germany and one on peace. Mm. Um, you mentioned that West Germany kind of clawed back its energy sovereignty mm. after the Ostpolitik and until the annexation of Crimea. And I'm, I was just wondering how you could describe a situation like Germany in that years as energy sovereign. Um, mm. If you could explain that a yeah. little bit. And the second question is a bit broader. Um, you described many of the conflicts related to energy in the first part of the 20th century, um, but didn't mention any of the conflicts arising um, on the transformation towards net zero. Um, and would you put the war in Ukraine right now, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, in this broader context of the transition towards net zero, our decoupling from Russian fossil fuels um, until 2030, which was announced before the war and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, I should have been a bit clearer about this energy sovereignty question. What I mean by that is that Germany has a foreign energy dependency problem from the beginning of the age of uh, oil. And what happens uh, as a result of the the Second World War is that it, in some sense, I would say, is stripped of its authority, partly formally and partly informally, to decide how to handle that problem. That are basically the Americans set parameters and they set legal restrictions initially in relation to coal. And obviously, the initial idea in Roosevelt administration is actually completely to really to abolish Germany's energy sovereignty, the Morgenthau plan, because it's to deindustrialize Germany. And I've kind of come to the view that the best way to understand the motivation of that is actually to say, we can't have Germany having a foreign energy dependency problem. And if that's the case, we can't have it be an industrial power because you can't be an industrial power without having uh, energy. And that was going, that was going to um, mean um, oil. And then you have these various episodes where basically the Americans say, no, you can't do that. I, I know they're not saying no directly to the West Germans at Suez, but that's how Adenauer experienced um, it. They say no to the Drusba pipeline uh, in terms of Germany being able to sell um, steel pipes. Uh, they don't say no to the first ga no, gas trade with that Brandt's contracts. They do try to then say no to Trans-Siberian, oh sorry, missing out the selling, saying no to buying uranium from the United States. So when I say sovereignty, I mean the authority to decide how to deal on German terms with the German foreign fossil fuel dependency problem. It's not just foreign, foreign resource dependency problem. Let's, let's, um, let's call it um, that. I think this question of like how we should understand the tumor of the last year in relation to the different energy questions in play is like is really complicated. Um, I'm not of the view that Russia or the Russian leadership is particularly worried about the speed in which the energy transition is going to occur such that Russia is going to end up um, without markets in the medium term for its um, 
for you know for for its oil and gas. If we just take oil, even probably on an optimistic scenario, uh, the world's using about 100 million barrels of oil a day at the moment. If we're in 30 years' time, we're using 60 million. That would be pretty good, really, compared to the speed of change like so far. And then you ask where that 60 million is going to come from. Probably 10 million of it will be coming from Russia. Um, which is about 10 million of what's coming from Russia at, at, at the moment. It's, it's, it's quite hard to see how Russia isn't in the last group standing where oil production um, is um, concerned. So I, I, I don't really buy any explanation that says Putin's motivated to act in the way in which he has because he realises the time of Russian leverage quite quickly coming to an end i don't think that that's i i don't think that that's um the case um neither am i really convinced quite convinced by the idea that um russia really wants the donbass for resource reasons for itself um i think that the the real um, opportunities in energy terms for Russia for the medium term are in the Arctic and in shale in Siberia, and they're not in, in, the, in the Donbass. I think it's reasonable to say that probably the Russians don't want Western, i.e. American companies operating in Ukraine or in the Black Sea which was the case prior to the annexation of, of, of Crimea. I think you can actually make quite a reasonable argument that makes resources, not Russia trying to procure resources, but Russia trying to shut out American companies in particular from Ukraine and Black Sea oil and gas exploration as a reason as to why Putin decided to annex Crimea in, in 2014. I think it's pretty hard to come up with a pipeline explanation for why he made this move against Ukraine. After all, um, there's only two pipelines <laughs> that is bringing gas to Europe, or well, there are only two sets of pipelines that are still bringing gas to Europe, one under the Black Sea, the Turk Stream, and the other is through Ukraine's um, system. So even at this point, uh, Ukraine makes money by transiting Russian gas. Uh, to um, to Europe. So I, I, I don't think that Putin, the war is motivated by directly by energy concerns or energy resource conflict concerns, let's call it um, that. I think it may have been motivated by, in part, by fears about Russian position in the Black Sea and that that does have an energy dimension um, to it. But I think fundamentally, Putin has never recognized the legitimacy of an independent Ukrainian nation state. And I think that that's not in the end about energy. Uh, the war, though, ha quite obviously has profound energy implications, but I'm not really convinced it's the cause of it, though I do think it's, as I say, I do think it, it's an important part of the, the, the reason for the annexation of Crimea. Okay, any... Okay, then I can chip in for a moment um, with another question, and that is, you, you, I mean, I actually have two questions, but the mm. first one is, um, they describe Europe typically as the UK, you, um, Germany, France. Mm -hmm. I mean, we clearly have a very different constellation now with the enlargement of the European Union and with, you mentioned it partly with Eastern Europe um, becoming part of the European policy mix. And of course, now we, uh, I mean, spe especially since the war, we have really deep uh, cleavages between uh, Eastern Europe and parts of Western Europe. And I wonder how you see this playing out in terms of broader European policies, and especially in terms of the, the energy question. 
uh, that's going to, uh, that faces the, the EU. Um, maybe I, I stay with this. And yeah, I okay. Think. Yeah. Um, I, I realize I, 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 I did oversimplify, and it was because I wanted to um, give tie the origins of European integration to energy, and, and obviously that takes us to six countries <laughs> initially. Um, well, I think that um, right from the start, i.e. really in the 90s, actually, not just in 2005, that the fact that the European Union was going to enlarge to include states that had recent experience of Soviet rule, whilst a number of European countries, including Europe's most important economy, had a deep energy trade relationship with Russia that included its corporates having, in the end, some production rights, that that was a, a fault line through the post-Cold War EU from the, from, the, from the beginning. And you can see it really clearly, I think, in the muddles that the European Union gets into around Ukraine, the pipelines, associate membership of the European Union, non-membership of NATO, the disruption that Russian-Ukraine relations caused to transmission of gas through the pipeline or transportation of gas through the pipeline in, like, in 2009. It's all really clear by that point, and it's really clear how divisive it is. And one of the things, and this is where I would switch absolutely into being a critic of Merkel, <laughs> is that every time, and I followed this really quite closely in, in, in real time, is in, the, in that period between 2015 and 2020, Merkel would say things like, um, it's for Germany or for the European Union to decide um, whether Nord Stream 2 goes ahead. The Americans should basically like butt out of it. And then she'd say things like, it's really important also um, that gas continues to be transited through Ukraine for Ukraine security. And that could only mean, when you start thinking about it, that Germany would get its gas through Nord Stream 1 and 2, and perhaps a little bit still through Yamal, Europe, which doesn't go through Ukraine. And other European countries, i.e. Southern European countries, would get their gas still through Ukraine. And I think it was very divisive, the fact that the European Commission allowed Nord Stream, both the Nord Stream pipelines to go ahead without interference. And yet it worked quite actively um, with the Obama administration to bring South Stream pipeline, which was under the Black Sea, but coming out in Bulgaria to, to stop it. Um, indeed, when I said, this, I was doing some talk with some people at the commission, and one of them came up to me afterwards, in fact, maybe not even afterwards, I think it was something else he said to me afterwards, and he said, oh, we didn't just work with Obama, we told him what to do <laughs> about it, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but he really wanted to boast that the European Commission had brought South Stream to um, an end. So even, in, and this is, this, that's 2013, so this is before we even get to the annexation of, of, um, of um, Crimea. And so, if we then say, what has the war done to this? On the one side, we can say, look, it's vindicated the view in Warsaw over the view in Berlin and Paris. It's, uh, Warsaw's been, I mean, this is a bit schematic, but if we just put it like this, Warsaw's been vindicated, Berlin and Paris were, were wrong about this. Okay, sort of. And I say sort of because actually, um, European countries led by France and Spain have actually been importing more liquid natural gas from Russia than they've ever done before. At one point during the course of last year, France was the biggest importer of liquid natural gas in the world. So it's not like this division has gone away because the pipelines and the Nord Stream pipelines are, you know, are um, no um, more and the Russians essentially uh, embargoed pipeline gas coming through Yamal and, 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 and um, Nord Stream um, 1. If you then look at the energy transition, 
it gets like even more complicated because you've got divisions in the energy mix between European countries, whichever way that you look. And that's true in terms of, if we're gonna use that language of old Europe and new Europe, Germany and France's energy mix don't look anything like uh, each other's. If you go into Eastern Europe, countries that you would have put together before the war, perhaps Poland and Hungary, they've gone completely different ways where the war is concerned. They've got energy mixes that don't look like um, each other, not least in relation to um, nuclear um, power. And as we know, it's Orban who's been the one who's basically gone off and negotiated a, a separate supply deal with Gazprom for, uh, for Hungary. Then if you turn to the Western part, the Western coast of, Southwestern coast of Europe, um, Spain, Portugal, France, what to do about really the Algeria question, which is back in a, in a, new, in a new form now. Again, you've got quite you know, serious divisions. In the autumn, there were France, sorry, the Germans and the Portuguese and the Spanish wanted to resurrect with EU money, a pipeline that would go through the Pyrenees, a gas pipeline that would go through the Pyrenees. Macron said no. Then he agreed with Spain that there would be a, a Barcelona Marseille underwater pipeline, but it would be used for gas and hydrogen. And then he pulled the plug on the gas because European Commission weren't going to pay for a pipeline, provide money for a pipeline that was going to include gas. So even when you haven't got divisions of views about Russia, then you've got you know really both conflicts of interest because the energy mixes are just radically different and different judgments about how to deal with present tense fossil fuel energy problems in relation to the energy transition. Yanis? Thank you. My question is about um, that sort of that elephant in the room, if you like, well, you, you've alluded to it a couple of times, this, um, or actually referred to it as, as this um, apparent way out of energy dependency during the 1950s, the nuclear energy, which right now is sort of, I mean, it seemed to be a thing of the past, at least in Germany, very much so. Now it's, it's not so sure, it's not so clear anymore if, if this is the case. Um, although it, it seems like Germany is actually going through with um, with ending its uh, its nuclear power program altogether, whereas France, for instance, isn't at all. And I'm really wondering, like a lot of like your explanations regarding coal, gas, etc., are driven by by interests, I guess. And I'm wondering, does nuclear energy also fit these paradigms, or is there more, let's call it ideology, at play? Because clearly Germany has a problem, like a um, an, an ideological problem with nuclear energy, if you like, uh, if you want to call it that, and France doesn't. Does that explain the, the, these different approaches, or is there? Can you sort of make an interest-based argument there as well? This is a really interesting question, and if you um, if you fiddle around with data on our world in data, like I do, <laughs> putting in different countries and their energy mixes. Uh, into you do anything with nuclear power and the first thing you'll see as soon as you put in like more than two countries is France is just a complete outlier um, so alone in the world France actually uses more nuclear power oh sorry I'll re rephrase that alone in the world nuclear power is France's single biggest source of energy bigger than oil um, th th there's no country that's like anywhere close to, to where France is. And that's in a year when France had a terrible time with nuclear power <laughs> last year. It was 50% output for most of the time because of the, the, the maintenance um, problems. So although Germany uh, is, I would say, a bit of an outlier because it's the only western country that produced a political party out of the anti-nuclear movement in the 1970s or one of significant sentiments put it that way is it's still actually closer to the 
middle, if you see what I mean, than what France is, um, because uh, you know, countries, other, other countries that go down the nuclear power road basically back off it. And they don't do it really with the same um, drama, perhaps, that Germany has done it. But there is nowhere near as committed to nuclear power as they were. And indeed, even France was under Hollande. Uh, he was making commitments about how France was going to have it really reduce in half its nuclear um, power. So I think the question comparatively is much more, why is France such an outlier rather than what's really going on in Germany? There is, there is The German question needs an answer, but it's more like, why is France just radically different than anybody else? And I think it, it is, and this goes to the, how I think cost has been central to the nuclear power um, problem, is the French state did not balk at throwing, you know, throwing huge amounts of money at it. There was a certain point in which the idea of technological France, te the, the technological prowess of France was sufficiently invested in nuclear power and perhaps the vanity of the French state can justify spending these huge amounts of huge amounts of money on it. The second thing I would say, though, is is that each time there's an energy, a profound energy crisis, so, and I'd say if you want to put some markers for Europe, it would be 1956. So Suez, the 70s, the, the particularly the first oil price um, shock, and then now. There's a whole resurgence of interest in nuclear power. There's a little bit of, I think, of this. It's not so much ideological. It's almost a bit slightly utopian. Oh, nuclear's nuclear's just going to solve all this for us. That when we, when it gets hard, the answer is we'll just go back to nuclear. We'll we'll, we'll do it with micro reactors this time. It won't be it, it won't be so expensive. It can be made safer. Now, I'm I'm not an anti-nuclear power like person. I'm you know I'm pragmatic about. This I, I I think nuclear power will have some place in the mix. I think the micro nuclear reactors uh, probably are going to be quite um, important. So I'm not saying it because I'm just being dismissive about nuclear power, but it's really striking the language, how it becomes as if it hasn't been tried, as if it hasn't been done at scale, as if it hasn't run into these huge cost problems, and still obviously questions about. The waste and sometimes i think it, it's our get out when things get hard is to say let's find a way of doing nuclear power um better which is why i think that even germany has even if they i think if you'd said three years ago that germany would have had any kind of debate about nuclear power again most people would have said no you don't really understand german politics it's not like that but as i see i mean it, there has been some debate in Germany over the uh, the last year about whether whether, whether to continue um, down this path. Okay, let me come in again. Um, one question. So I, I, it struck me that during your talk at one point, you said it's not by chance that the US and uh, Russia at that time both are energy um, exporters and therefore they basically have their empire so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, now how, how, how do you think in terms of US Chinese rivalry at this current moment because the, the one striking difference clearly is that China is energy dependent and uh, how and therefore and I think this goes into some other um, areas of your expertise, therefore also much more dependent, I guess, financially on the US um, mm. than, than it would be otherwise. So how does this, I mean, it, it, this is the new Cold War now. Um, how does the geopolitics and the energy story plays out in this new Cold War? What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, there are two things going on here and they pull in opposite directions. The first is, as you said, Tara, that the United States, it's not energy independent, um, it's gas independent, but it, it's, it's not oil independent. 
um, not least because quite a lot of that shale that the US produces, it can't actually refine and needs to sell and then buy other kinds of crude oil from Canada uh, in um, particular. But obviously, the United States is in a much better position where oil and gas is concerned than China um, is, uh, particularly where oil is concerned. And the Chinese leadership have been you know, deeply worried about the oil question, overtly, I would say, since 2003, and probably actually way, way beyond that. China stopped being self-sufficient in oil in 1993. Uh, I think you could argue that if you go back to the 70s and then Xiaoping's economic reforms, the fact that they go hand in hand with population control, the one child policy is not a coincidence that Deng, I think, does understand that there's significant resource risk problems for China if China develops at all rapidly without slowing its population growth down. So I think the Chinese are, have a very strong sense of um, energy problems and oil problems. Uh, in particular, and obviously it's compounded by the fact that a lot of the oil that they import comes from the Middle East or from Africa, uh, and then ends up coming down the Strait of Malacca, uh, and that the Americans can, in the case of a war with Taiwan, over Taiwan, I should say, um, blockade, and that that would you know, be a lethal problem for, for, for China under under wartime um, conditions and part of the attraction of Russia I think has always been as an energy partner that it gets around that problem oil and gas pipelines uh, and now Russian liquid natural gas that can come via the Arctic route the, the northern sea route. On the other hand it's clearly the case that people in Washington are pretty terrified of China's energy revolution advantages and its dominance of metal supply mm. um, chains. Even Trump, who obviously is not the slightest interest in an energy transition, really, um, declared a metal and mineral emergency in the latter part of his presidency that Biden has effectively um, continued. If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, some of the language in the text itself is pretty open that it's about breaking China's dominance of the supply chains and replacing them with, um, I, I mean, by that energy transition supply chains and replacing them with American centric um, supply, so supply um, chains. I would, my view is, is that the whole US trade and tech war with China was really began or it was the, the point in which in Washington that the mindset moved to confrontation with China was actually when China published Made in China 2025 in, in um, May of 2015 and that actually Trump's presidency should be seen in that context where the China question is concerned because the one thing where Trump basically articulated what had become the bipartisan position was on China on this trade and tech war. And actually, um, Biden has driven it harder, I would suggest, than, 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 than Trump um, has. So I think that there's a sense in Washington that, that geopolitics and energy power go together. And so that whoever dominates the age of the energy of renewables will geopolitically dominate. Nonetheless, I think it, it's really important to see that actually the world in which we now live is a multi-source energy world. It's going to become more of a multi-source energy um, world. And so actually what we're going to live with is the geopolitics of fossil fuel fuels at the same time as the geopolitics of the energy revolution. So we're going to have more geopolitical fault lines than ever before around energy because we're going to be in a multi-source um, energy world and they don't line up with each other because China moves from having a resource, foreign resource dependency problem on the fossil fuel side outside coal to being in the dominant position where metals um, are um, concerned. 
and the United States um, is the reverse. Now, the one country that actually is in a, in principle, actually a strong position on all of them is, is Russia. Um, but Russia's embarked upon a geopolitical strategy that means that it's basically got to restructure its energy trade, at least in part, away from, from Europe to um, Asia. So in that sense, nobody's got that great a hand geopolitically. So in political science, normally overlapping or not, um, but not piling on each other, mm. cross cutting, yeah. uh, cutting cleavages or fault lines are a good thing. But you are saying they are a bad thing. They are spelling even more well, I, I, conflict. I, they could. I mean, I, I, I would say there's one sense in which that they uh, are an advantage, which is I think that China's foreign oil dependency is a serious constraint on how aggressive China can be. Mm. Um, because this vulnerability in the Strait of Malacca uh, is acute. Um, and even if you then move to a position where you say, okay, Russia will really reorientate a lot, China become more dependent upon Russia uh, for oil and gas, it'll reorientate a lot of trade through the Arctic, through the Northern Sea Route, that you know, the, the Northern Sea Route runs through the Bering Strait, and then you can just move from like a position where China is vulnerable in the Malacca to the position where it's vulnerable in the, in the Bering Strait to an American naval blockade. So I'm, I'm not sure the Chinese can really get around this, this problem. Okay. Are there any other questions, comments? from the audience. So Philip, I see you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> no, this is, you know, okay. So I listened to uh, uh, a political scientist who was gave, giving a historical talk. So thanks for that <laughs> uh, from a historian. I really enjoyed it. Um, but then I wondered a little bit, uh, you got a question in that direction already about uh, the model, the way of thinking, because, okay, states, leaders, certain dates, March 69, um, interest, conflict, maybe a solution. Um, and um, I was just wondering, is that, um, hmm, uh, is that how we can explain the world? or something as complex as um, an energy transition. So on, on the one hand, it was very convincing because it was so logical and the logic had its beauty. Um, but then, you know, I wonder about mm, ideology, uh, craziness, um, <laughs> maybe individual actors, um, maybe even female ones, I don't know. Uh, and that was Merkel. Um, but anyway, the economy, uh, you know, the, the, the big companies, corporations, mm -hmm. they were somewhere, but they were always dominated by the states. So um, I was just wondering about the model. And the second question is, um, you know, when, when you write about the rise of uh, neoliberal uh, policies, then of course, Britain played a key role. Mm. And I'm always wondering, um, I mean, Britain also changed from being basically a bankrupt IMF uh, creditor, right? Emergency credit to Britain. Mm. Oh, sounds like Argentine, didn't it? Um, to becoming uh, uh, a country which, where the leader risked uh, a major conflict with the main energy source back then, coal. Uh, but then there's North Sea oil. So did, did North Sea oil and the, you know, the balance of payment and all that, did that make possible the curse of neoliberalism? If you see the yeah, curse, I see uh, yeah. uh, but the, 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 the curse in the saturated version, let's be more mild. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> on the first question, so on the on the first question, I'm going to take the easy part of it first. Um, when I try to explain like long periods of like time relatively quickly, then. I tend to skip out the corporate part of the story, partly because it just makes 
it more complicated. And I found that certain being reasonably schematic about it is a way of allowing people to see what's going on. And that if you try and make it too complicated, then actually if people haven't sort of encountered thinking about energy geopolitically before they tend to get lost. So <laughs> I, 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 but I think for instance, it's really important to understand that one of the reasons why the world changes in the 1970s is because at the beginning of the decade, there were seven oil companies that basically control most of the world's oil production outside the Soviet Union. And by the end of the decade, then state-owned energy companies control most of the world's oil production. And obviously that now includes like the Soviet um, Union. So that really, I would say the end of European, the age, the end of European, the end of the age of European empire really ends at that point when these international oil companies that are basically dominated from the late 19th century into the like um, the 20th um, century are nationalized or their assets are nationalized and that we live in a world and we still live in this world of energy nationalism uh, and that's a really important part of why we live in the post-imperial world because we live in a world of energy nationalism amongst oil um, and it, um, amongst oil and gas um, producers. And I think that on the Nord Stream story, for instance, and why Merkel went ahead with the second Nord Stream, you can't really separate that out from the influence of BASF, you know, the German chemical um, company. So I, I don't want to, over, I, I, I don't want to write corporations out um, of the, of the um, story. Uh, the harder question to answer is this question of like how strong a materialist account of history that I, w that I either want to offer or that I sign up to. Um, if I were a hardcore energy materialist, I would have only written the first two parts of disorder. So the bit, the first part is about geopolitics centered on energy. The second part is about the economy since the 19, world economy since the 1970s, energy and finance. And then the third part is about democracies. And although I try and say something about this oil and American democracy question, energy is in it like a much, much less. So I don't think that the world we live in is reducible to energy questions or indeed to materialist questions. Indeed, I think an important part of democracy historically has been the, the way in which democracies have legitimated political authority by appeals to the idea of the nation and I think it's quite difficult to see how the European Union for the long term functions as a site of political authority without developing some kind of common European identity. And that I don't think that's reducible to meeting material um, aspirations. So, and if you, want, if you took me further away, I actually wanted to write a fourth part of this book, which was in the original plan. And I was gonna try to deal with religious cultural questions and their relationship to territorial formation in Europe, including of the kind of question of the religious aspects of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, all right? You know, the divisions within orthodoxy. So it, that turned out to be far too ambitious idea to think I could do in one book. But I'm saying that because I take those questions like seriously. And I think mo anyone who's a hardcore materialist wouldn't engage with religious questions analytically as much as I am willing to do, or indeed that they, they also actually interest me. Having said all that, that's a lot of caveats. <laughs> I still don't think you can understand geopolitics of the 20th century onwards without putting energy at the center of it. And I think it does explain a lot. And that once you see that, it's everything else is a little bit surface. And I, I, I know the reasons for hesitating about saying that, 
And I know that there's a risk of like, uh, of knocking out individuals like political judgment. And there is a way of which I think that um, we have to kind of grapple analytically with different leaders levels of energy consciousness or energy awareness, let's call it like that. And in a strange way, I kind of think that sort of engaging with the really hard question about Hitler and the Nazis gets at that because on the one hand, Hitler was like obsessed with energy questions. I mean, he literally knew about, you know, like oil wells in random fields in Texas, you know, with you know, minute shine of detail. And in one sense, you'd say then, okay, you can explain his obsession with conquering, you know, Baku uh, stemming from that. But at the same time, I would suggest Hitler was so obsessed with it all that it actually, I would suggest, like, actually destroyed his ability to make any kind of rational judgment about a geopolitical world in which Germany didn't have power. Because the very fact that Germany had such a problem should have, if he was really energy aware, should have made what he was proposing doing seem as catastrophically appallingly stupid as it turned out to be. So I, I, you still got to have something in about, I just want to try to get, you still got to have something in about what are people, what are leaders doing with the energy awareness that they, that, that, that they uh, have. Um, and I think that's where it gets really, that, that's where it gets really hard because actually you've got to try to some sense to try and get inside people's minds. And then not all this is not necessarily, if you go as a historian and you look at the archival evidence, you can see loads of things where they're clearly thinking about oil, um, but trying to understand the degree to which it informed their judgment to the exclusion of other considerations, that's a lot harder space. Now, Thatcher, I think, is actually interesting in the whole British story is interesting in this, in this respect, because I think that um, there are two things that were true about Thatcher and energy, and in way both of them related to then the neoliberalism question. The first of them was a sense that British conservative politicians have had for a long time that there wasn't just the problem of foreign oil dependency that Britain faced, but there was a problem of domestic political difficulty that came from the need for coal that coal had elevated the miners into a really the most significant trade union movement, sorry, the most significant trade union in the country. And they were at the center of the British trade union um, movement. And that that had elevated the working class in Britain to more political influence than they could possibly have had without Britain's need for coal, not just for economic reasons, but when the time when Britain still had a coal you know, like fueled navy, um, which is you know some of those naval boats right up to the First World um, War, and you know, Winston Churchill, you know, was, who was then at the Admiralty, he was very aware of the relationship between strikes in South Wales and the ability of the British Navy to project power in Singapore because the South Welsh miners were the ones who were producing the coal that the navy was. Um, using and I think that Thatcher did in taking the miners on want in a way to end that political dependency problem if we can call it that of like seeing that if you if you had less coal then the trade unions were going to be less significant and the advantage of oil although it was foreign oil dependency was that you could use essentially indented Indian labor in Persia for the labor force for extracting your energy and not stroppy South Welsh miners who go on strike and get, you know, want, want, want wage increases. So, and I think that there is evidence that Thatcher had some awareness of those issues. On the oil question then, obviously Britain's fortune is at the point in which it becomes impossible to carry on as an imperial power in the Middle East, they have to leave retreat from east of Suez, as it's um, called, announced in 1968. 
implemented like in 1971 at just that time fortuitously there's oil in the north sea discovered the problem this time is something different politically is that it's largely in scottish waters in the north sea and not in english waters in the north sea and immediately the scottish nationalists start to use the oil as a um a rallying call 1974 election general election or the two general elections in 1974 scottish nationalists get their breakthrough and i think one of the then when thatcher's talking about markets she's very keen on markets for like north sea oil. she doesn't want a state run company she doesn't set up a sovereign wealth fund for the oil revenues like the norwegians like do because i think that she does get she kind of gets that if you just make it market 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 that you try and diffuse this is it scottish oil or uk um or you keep the state they keep the british state out of north sea oil because if you let the north if you get the british state engaged with north sea oil then it becomes a question that the scottish nationalists can use a bit too a, a bit too effectively and what i do think more generally about neoliberalism in the 70s is that i think that the the places where it happens uh, or what, you know britain and the us are dominating both of them uh want market principles in domestic energy industry so reagan is obsessed with deregulating the federal energy state in the us the fact the very first executive order he issues is to end the remaining federal controls on the us energy um, industry so when they say they want markets they do but i think the thing that they want the most in is about energy for different reasons in in britain um, and the us and if you take someone like milton friedman as a neoliberal figure he was obsessed with the energy with it with the with the federal regulation of the oil industry in the united states and he wanted it dismantled I mean, that's really interesting because that's the one story we never read when we talk about yeah. neoliberalism. Right? And it also it's, means it explains yeah. why West Germany is different as well, because West doesn't have a domestic in, in a energy industry, has to be much more cautious, much more emphasis on energy security. Can't think markets is going to solve the problem for it. And that might also go a long way explaining France. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, I was just thinking when you were answering to Philip's question. Uh, so when I read, so about, you know, what's beyond materialism. Yeah. When I read your book, um, the, the whole story on energy was really an eye opener for me. And I think for many people who read that book, because as we just established, you don't, I'm a political economist, you don't really tend to think for whatever strange reason about yeah. energy, which is really a, blind, a big blind spot, a big elephant in the room. But then when I came, then I read the, the other two parts and I, I kind of felt the, the connection or the big picture, I lost the big picture basically. And I was wondering now when I listened to your response to, to Philip, thinking of Susan Strange, who has this structural power international mm -hmm. forms of structural power and she basically says there are if i remember well there are four power structures she doesn't have energy either mm -hmm. unless i'm mistaken but she has production she has knowledge she has finance and um transport i think or um, mm -hmm. no money no Mo fin finance That's production yeah. knowledge non and there is a fourth yeah, one is. so is it do you think in terms of her concept of structural power which is basically mm. these can these don't necessarily have to be aligned and it's, it can be a different mix of politics and markets and i don't know what but you get uh, you get different types of structures in each area and different conflicts then also not only resulting from the fault lines within these areas but also between the areas is that a way to think about yeah i see what you're meaning i mean i think that the reason um I, th I think the way that I thought about it was, or in a way, not you know, still do think about it, is that the Industrial Revolution, like, I think creates the condition, well, I've got to go back one step further. If there is something that can be called modernity, 
in the Industrial Revolution created it. And the Industrial Revolution is actually an energy revolution. And that changed human beings' whole relationship to nature. I'm not always keen on the idea of the Anthropocene, but you could fit that into um, this. And it meant that we were basically you know, committed to endless extraction of resources out of the earth. And that actually isn't gonna stop with the energy um, transition. And that we, as a consequence of that, constantly need technological innovation in order to keep going because we are taking non-renewable resources and we have to make them do more. Uh, and the way that we uh, do uh, have been doing that since the Industrial Revolution is applying ever better technology to those energy um, resources. And I think that that is so fundamental to the way in which we live in the modern world, that that is in some sense primary. I then think within, because of the way that the world economy developed since the 1970s, that finance is the next most important thing. Um, not least because actually finance is the way uh, that and creation of so much more debt and ending with any metallic based currency is the way that Western countries found out of the problems of the 1970s around um, energy. But the reason why I kind of like always like hesitate and then say, but this doesn't explain everything. And I'm gonna write a third part of this book that's gonna be about democracies is because I think that the underlying political problem, which is like, how do you have order? And how do you not have disorder? That I think does go through from the pre-modern, if I'm making modernity start with industrial revolution, I think that that's kind of there all the time, if you see what I mean. Like, how do you, ha how do you, how does political authority manage sufficiently to legitimate itself that it's not constantly collapsing, not constantly prone to crisis. And I don't think that problem in its basic structural political form is really any different in the post-industrial revolution world than it was in the pre-industrial revolution world. So I, I think that there's like, I don't think that was fundamentally changed by the industrial revolution, but I think the conditions of our material lives were fundamentally changed by the industrial revolution but that makes it a bit awkward mm. because uh, you you i'm kind of trying to operate both with a kind of like analytical framework that's very much like these are modern conditions that we must understand fundamentally via energy terms and then saying actually there are older political problems that are continuous like through that and that they now work out under those material conditions but they're structurally still sort of like that they were before. And I realize that that's a, I realize it's an awkward juxtaposition and I realize it causes some narrative issues <laughs> in the book, but that's the way that I think about yeah. the world. And so I, I can be persuaded that that's wrong if you see what I mean, but that, that's, my, that, that, that's my starting place that there is, that there, there is something that modernity creates that's new and then there are these political problems um, that are um, enduring and then we have to try to understand each in their own terms and then try and put them together. How to follow. Questions now, um, <laughs> and they are both very broad, but the first one is, if you talk about energy in this very historical long durée, durée uh, perspective, isn't it actually necessary to start before fossil fuel and also take into account um, the basically the first type of exploitation and it is uh, humankind, namely slavery. I mean, I'm thinking of history is now like um, Howard French, um, Power and Blackness, that show very clearly that the, the early uh, 
pre-industrial phases of, of uh, colonialism and so on started with the slavery, the exploitation of, of human of, uh, of human force. So that is that is the first question. Wouldn't it necessary to even include this in your long history? Um, the second question is, or it's more a, 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 yeah, a conceptual question. Um, when I read your book, um, and I was really fascinated about it, um, it reminded me a little bit about this very slick economic model that Danny Roderick had developed about yeah. the trilemma of um, uh, uh, globalization. And I would just like to know what you what you think about yeah. that, about this analogy. Yeah, I'll start with that one. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, I'm pretty sympathetic to um, to Roderick's analysis uh, of the of the globalization um, trilemma. Um, I read quite a lot of him over the um, years. I, you know, he's coming at it in a different way for me in the sense that he's less concerned about energy, but he's an economist and I'm not. But I, I, I think certainly my understanding of the relationship between democracy and the world economy, uh, and particularly the relationship between monetary autonomy questions, democratic politics questions and capital flows questions, I think I'm pretty much on the same page um, that that he is. I mean, in terms of long history, I mean, if I was going to write a, a, um, a history of energy in human history, I absolutely would make slavery central to the pre-industrial part of that. The reason I didn't engage with it here is, is because my starting place in writing disorder was always I wanted to try and explain the political disruptions of the 2010s. And I wanted to go back in each case as far as I thought I needed to go back to make sense you know, of that. Um, the reason why I was so keen on the let's start at the beginning of the age of oil was both because I think there's a European problem that arises from that moment that doesn't change. Uh, in terms of the structure of the problem, not obviously the approaches to answering it, but also because I knew that I could like maneuver myself from, look, America and Russia are competing to sell oil to European countries at the turn of the 19th, 20th century. And now in the 2010s, they're competing to sell gas to European um, countries. But I don't think, I mean, I've not spent as much time thinking about this as I want to yet, and I probably will at some point, is... I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it can really be a coincidence that largely the age of slavery ends and the age of fossil fuel energy um, begins. Um, and that until that point of fossil fuels, basically human societies, human civilizations generally have slavery uh, and a certain kind of human energy is coerced into doing certain economic activities and that when then it becomes possible to do those economic activities or do economic activities on a whole other scale by using fossil fuel energy then slavery comes to an end now I, again i know again you say that and then you're kind of like open to, well, don't you think that black people had moral and religious beliefs about slavery and abolition? And I think, yes, they did, absolutely. And I, and, 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 and I, 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 haven't got a, I haven't got enough actually straight, straight historical knowledge to like say, okay, this is how that transition or whatever you want to call it happened. But do I at a big picture level think that they go together? Then I think that they do. Um, absolutely fascinating. I think we have close coming to our end. Um, so unless there is an urgent question, maybe we should just give you also the opportunity to enjoy this evening <laughs> and relax. <laughs> and mostly thank you very, very much for being here and for uh, giving us this analysis and you know trying to address all these important questions. Thank you very much, Helen. Yeah.